Johnson. Episode number nine. Number nine. Number nine. With Ryan Bruce, Fluff, Rips and Beards. We talk about life and all its peculiarities. Check out his music on the Players Pick Podcast playlist on Spotify. What's going on, man? Oh, man. Just uh, hanging out, uh, looking at your sexy beard. Well, thank you. I'm and, looking at yours. Ah. You have... Your your beard has girth. It has girth currently, yes. Yeah. It's... Uh, I, let, I let no shave ember turn into the sim beard. <laughs> I was going to say, I've never seen it. I don't, I don't know if I've seen it this long in a while. Yeah, it's usually it's usually like once a year, but some years I skip it. And I yeah. just like stay... I'm yeah. like, ah, oh, man, it's too much. Because like, even though I enjoy it... It's one of those things, as you know, like, mm-hmm. you're like, uh, it also has its drawbacks. Dude. You know, cleaning it and, Dude, and yeah. like, my, my eat lady. It, eating it, you know, sometimes. My lady always wants, she likes homeless status. She wants the beard as long as possible. Oh. But, so I've been growing it out pretty long. This is the longest it's been in a long time. What I hate about it is, like, when I'm wearing a jacket, like a Dickies jacket, it's constantly getting caught in the zipper. Not yeah. zip, not zip up, but just on the, on oh, the uh, yeah, just on the teeth with the teeth. Yes. Yeah, it's oh, it drives me nuts, dude. That's no fun. I hate it, but that's what she wants, and we both know like that. Well, that's what she gets then. Cause I, I'm, I'm impressed. Like I, I know that those women exist she that loves wa- it. that want that, yep. and it, I, you know, I think there's been maybe one or two that have come in through my life that have kind of like made that request, but most of the time, I what I get. Is like, oh yeah, I saw that picture of you like more clean shaven. And can you do that? Like that's really nice. Like like hint hint. I'm like, you clean up pretty nice. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, no. Oh god. Mine's a keeper. She's oh, uh, she's like, please just look like <laughs> you are an Appalachian lumberjack oh, and yeah. just wear flannel and just do manly stuff. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, that's that's that is cool. That's yeah. a, that's a that's a perk. Yeah. In, yeah she's a great the... she's a great lady. Wow. Oh. You're you're a lucky man. <laughs> I am. She um, me this. Well, so you you're on tour right now with mm-hmm. Rest for Pose. We're yeah. we're at, we're in the van outside of the Boardwalk in Sa- Sacramento area. I think it's actually considered not Sacramento or like Orangevale or something. I was, yeah, I think it's Orangevale. Is it Orangevale? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny funny quick story. This parking lot, I have this little cool memory because I, I I've been here a handful of times way back in the day. Because uh, I used to come down here from Chico to see uh-huh. shows, and uh, this this local band called Fallon uh, from okay. Chico was like the hometown metal heroes, like super cool, like older guys, and yeah. we always go over to their practice pad and smoke weed and just be like, they're way better than us, and this sucks, <laughs> right? Like, and like, and they're they're and they always they were friends with Testament. And we were just like, Whoa. what, like. How are you friends with Testament? They're like one of the coolest bands of all time. I mean, they and, are. Yeah, and they really are. But uh, like, and they're like, hey man, we just played a lot of shows. And like, you, you, hey, you know what? You should come down. We're opening for them at the place called the Boardwalk. And I'm like, oh man, okay. Testament played here. Yeah, Testament I, on the Demonic tour. No. Yeah, they played here a, b- a bunch of times back in the day. But it was a demonic a demonic tour, uh, and uh, I was, I got to be the roadie for a second, like for Fallon. And, uh, they went and, uh, so, so we, so coming here and seeing Fallon, my hometown hero band open up for Testament. And then afterwards in this parking lot, hanging out here, uh, talking to, to, to the, some of the band, Eric Peterson and stuff. And then Chuck Billy, uh, was like just kicking it. And, uh, and he, the, the people were giving him weed and stuff. And I was like, Oh, he smokes. That's so cool. And I, yeah. and I, and I worked at this, this, uh, this head shop called the Underground in in Chico. There's your end. Yeah, you know, and I, and I, ha- I had a brand new prototype. <laughs> oh, that, like that, like the one of those br- old brass prototypes. Yeah. Pro- and I was like, this is this is my chance to like try and like do something for my hero, Chuck Billy. Man, <laughs> I just see him. I just saw him shred, and I'm like, hey man, like I want to give this to you, you know? And he's like, what? He's like, no. He tried to give it back. I'm like, no, I want to give this to you. Like, you're like one of the greatest like metal <laughs> vocalists of all yeah. time. And I just that was my that was my thing. He's like. Oh, that's so cool! And like he get, he goes like, let's go get you a shirt. You want a shirt? And I was like, yeah, I want a shirt. Holy shit! So he he walked me into the merch booth and he's like, here, you know, pick out whatever you want. And so I, I got a, a demonic, uh, you know, shirt from the tour. From when whatever. Testament played the boardwalk. The boardwalk. Yeah, yeah. So it was just like that. That when driving up here today, I was like, man, this is cool. I haven't been here in, in, in a minute, and and that, that whole scene just went rip, whipped through my mind, you know, all over again. So it's always been called the boardwalk. Yeah, for. 
as long as I've known. So the problem with uh, venues in Seattle is they change they change names probably every other year or <laughs> right, so. Right. Right. But if you know your know your shit or you know somebody who's been around long enough, like oh yeah, like. That old shithole? Like, yeah, I remember Nirvana played there in 89. Right. Or... The off-ramp, which used to be the you know, right. turned into was... Graceland and then yes. the El Corazon. And, yes, exactly. And now is it called something else? Is it no, it's still, still Elko. Elko. Okay, Elko's been gone for a, a oh, minute then. Yeah, about 20 years now. It's... I was there I was there when... Oh, my God. I was there when I'm it getting, changed We're getting too. old, Fluff. I know. <laughs> I can't fucking deal with this. <laughs> this is like... Because I was... Years. I was... Yeah, I think I moved... Yeah, I moved there in 2000... 2000 yep. and like I think it was maybe two years. I was later. Gonna say about 2002. Yeah, it's so like when it hit when it turned over. That's damn near 20 years, buddy. Uh, uh, yeah. This whole time thing is interesting. I don't like it. I'm not. I mean, part of me is okay with it, but the other part, like that, just means that there's less of it coming up. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a yeah. interesting. But uh, but I like it. Like like my daughter is 17. She drives now, mm -hmm. so I don't have to go over. To her mom's house to see her. She can come, just, just get in the car. Come on over. Come on over. You want to go to dinner? Cool. Come pick me up. Cut, drive, drive, Daddy Fluff to get Dude. like the what we're getting. You get. fly, I buy. Yeah, that's. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's worth having a kid. Almost. I love it. It's it's really <laughs> great. Like I need someone to watch the dogs while I'm gone on tour. Hey, honey. Yeah. <laughs> go let the dogs out. Dude, having built-in dog watcher, man. I, yeah. I have it's to, wonderful. I, I have to pawn my dog off on either my neighbor. That's the worst. Or my other fr a homie across town, and they're both cool. Totally. And, and, and they both have boy dogs that my dog considers like you know inseparable boyfriend yeah. type of scenario so it, it works but um you know i end up and, and they, they they don't charge me you know if, all the time like i'm like oh the other place costs like 60 bucks a day to like board your dog yep. and then the, they're not they're not cuddled at night and, like no like drop them they off don't like care no they don't i mean they, they, they care, care to a point as much as a stranger can right and they're like yeah i gotta go home and right. call my own dog right i get it right right but, yeah uh, yeah, so, well, I mean, you know what we're here for, right? This is Player's Pick Podcast. Yeah. Um, and I like to talk about guitar picks up front after oh, getting man, to know. Oh, man, I'm so stoked. So I know you've got good stories, and, and, and mm -hmm. my part of my, I just, my ongoing quest is like, I, it's about pick origin stories. I want to know who gave you your first pick or uh, what you remember about your first few picks and, and how has it evolved through the years to get you to where you're at. You know, now. I've been I've been asked a lot of questions, and I've never been asked this ever, and I'm really excited to answer it. Yeah. Okay. I started play okay, so I wanted to play guitar. I was delivering newspapers. I was in eighth grade, and uh, you were riding a bike on like a paper yep, route. Yep, Sick. I was. Sick. I and that's that and that's how I got my my tapes. Like I bought Nirvana's In Utero when that came out in '93. Oh. Yeah. Right? And then when Kurt killed himself, mm. I decided I'm gonna play guitar now. Like it's time. Like mm. I feel like I should just I should make that step because I always wanted to, and I kind of had my grandmother's acoustic. But I didn't know there was. I didn't know what a pick was. So I was trying to do it by with my fingers. Mm -hmm. So my mother um, has an older brother, my uncle Dennis. Um, and she was like, "Well, I think your uncle Dennis has an amp and a guitar from like when we were teenagers, like the late seventies that he made." Whoa. Well, actually, it was a it was an early Warmoth guitar, but it was a set. It was a neck through body. Neck through. Oh, really? It was a neck through Warmoth. It was a kit guitar that he got from Warmoth. Did he do the setting and gluing? No, he uh, bought it as like a kit guitar from them. Oh, with like the block headstock and then cut the own headstock yeah. and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. And, but it had like a brass nut. It had all brass hardware. It was so 70s. Mm. And he had taken a sponge with different turquoise. It was a white, <laughs> blue, and seafoam green. And he just dabbed it with a sponge. It was dude. so 70s, dude. It was yes. awesome. Two DiMarzio Super Distortions. This is your first guitar? It's my first guitar. Oh my God, this is so cool. Okay, keep um, going. So we go over to my uncle. So my mom makes a phone call and we go over to my uncle's and, and he was like, so you want to play guitar, huh? And he's like, you have to make me a promise. If you play guitar, cause I, my, my uncle's favorite band of all time still to this day is ACDC. Right. Rightfully so. So he gets it out and he gets out this really shitty Dean Markley Spectra 10 watt solid state amp that sounds like garbage. And he starts playing the, uh, the intro to Thunderstruck. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's like, you have to eventually learn this one day. If I sell you, I know I'm going to sell you this guitar. And I was like, oh, how much? Like, I don't, I'm a kid. I'm 14 years old, right? <laughs> Delivering newspapers. And he was like, I want 75 bucks for the pair. And I'm going to throw in the pedals with it too. And I'm like, Whoa. I don't know what that is. I'm like, what are pedals, right? Yeah. A, 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 a Crybaby Wah. Oh. A, a Boss PH1 two knob 
phaser, the original, original, original oh, phaser. Sick. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And um, an Electro Harmonics uh, Little Muff. Perfect. Right? So 70s, dude. Yeah. And he must have been on it because, like, those pedals were not super common and easy to find in the late 70s. Right, right. Anyway, in that case, there was a pack of Ernie Ball strings and then there was a couple of. Um, there were there were Dunlop Protex. Picks. Remember what colors? Um, th- there was a yellow. They were they were really thin. I remember them being like really flappy. So um, maybe it, there was yellow and red and orange or something. Maybe? Orange, orange. It was orange, okay. and then there was like a few of like there was this weird felt pick. I don't know what the hell. Like it was a piece of felt cut out in the shape of a pick, and it was. I, I don't know. They'll usually. I think those are used for like bass, like to give the the, the finger feel with the mutes or yeah, it's something. Yeah, like, it's a mute. It's like a muted sound. That, oh, see, I didn't know that. I think that's what mostly. I'm I, no, I I'm no bass player. I have. No I idea. never knew. Like, why would you use that? Yeah. But there was a couple of Tortex in there. Okay. And I think there might have been like some. I think there might have been like a odd, the odd Fender, the odd celluloid. The yeah, yeah, like sure. old stuff. Yeah. But I started using the Tortex because he was like, well, these ones are the good ones. And like, there's a few of them in here, so use these. Yeah. Okay. And so I learned on that orange and I think it was the yellow standard Tortex yeah. pick. And I just, I totally fell in love with it. And then uh, I used, so then, okay, so eventually I'll truncate this. Uh, it's, it's a long story, but I'll truncate. So I eventually I get a Strat. I get my first real guitar, which is a Strat when mm-hmm. I was 15. Mm hmm. And I'm really into, I'm getting really into strings and gear, so I'm still into Ernie Balls, and I'm still getting into picks, but I want something a little bit thicker, and a friend of mine had a, a purple Tortex, uh, and I'm like, where did you get that? And he's like, oh, I just, my mom took me to the store, and you know, at this point I'm like 16. Mm-hmm. So I, I get my mom to drive me down to uh, Don's Green River Music in Auburn, Washington, and I get a bunch of purple Tortexes. And they were just like, it's just, you know, obviously the difference is night and day between the purple yeah. and the orange. Oh, man, huge. You know, I was just like, oh, my God, now I can finally play the things I'm hearing on the radio. And at this time, it was you know, like, you know, Offspring and Green Day had just hit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, you know, a huge Nirvana fan, Alice in Chains. You know, I was a Seattle grunge kid. And I played the purples for, oh, man, probably a decade, even though they were way too heavy for what I was trying to do. <laughs> So like I'd break strings sometimes, but I was just like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to use anything else but these purple Tortexes. So eventually, I joined a band, and the co- the other guitarist in the band is like, hey, you should try these, and they're the Sharp. Oh. And so he has the purples, but they're sharp. The super sharp. The yeah. super sharp. Yeah. And not the Dorito ones, but the other just the regular sharp. Right. And the real pointy, and he was like, the attack on these. Here's how you here's how you choke up on it, like. Good enough for James Hetfield, how he holds his pick. It's, that's how you want to pick. So, mm. I used the Sharps for another four or five years. Wow. And uh, and so then, eventually, um, get a little older, get a little bit more money in your pocket. And I'm like, oh, I want to try some picks. Mm-hmm. And eventually, I settled on the green Tortex. Okay. Um, I was unaware of the T3s because I wanted the Jazz 3s. But I didn't like the physical size of them, and like the store was, it didn't have everything that sure. Dunlop makes. But I was always a Dunlop guy, always, always, always a Dunlop guy. Because um, this is, sounds silly, but um, whenever we would play shows, I hated the dust that would accumulate from the celluloid or any other brands. Totally. That drove me insane. And and the Dunlop stuff didn't do that, and mm-hmm. that's why I stuck with Dunlop throughout my entire childhood and young adult. Playing gigs, so you'd have to clean up the mess. I don't want to. I don't want to clean up my guitar. Yeah, no. but if it's dirty, I have to clean it up. Yeah, right. So like, I played in hardcore punk bands, and we would just you know upside down American flag and talking about WTO riots. And, like, yeah, we were like the punk rock rage against the machine. We were so angry, and fun. and I wish the, I would have known you back then. That would have been fun. It was a lot of fun. Like we were, <laughs> we used to play like political rallies and stuff. Like it was like wow. we were we were hip to it because like we were just angry. Sure. But along with all that anger was those damn Tortex picks. Mm-hmm. Uh, so mainly it was the green one for, oh God, a long, long, long time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's what I played up until, I don't know, I think it's probably when I met you. You were like, you want to try something else? What, have you ever tried anything else? And I was like, no. Was it, did, did I make you try the Altex? Yeah. I, the Altex yes. Sharps? Yeah. Because you did Altex Sharp for a while. 
I think it was a long time. Yeah, a couple of years at least. One point one four. That's right. Uh, and that was when I got into rest. So when we started rest for pose, I wanted something that would last a little longer, but had a little bit more attack because I was playing Maze of Boogie amps at the time, and I couldn't mm-hmm. get that. I couldn't get that attack that I was really looking for. Mm-hmm. So I, I was trying to change up picks because you're like, you know, that's going to make a huge sound, or a huge difference in your sound. And you were absolutely right. So the old Texas mm-hmm. were it, and then I switched to uh, orange amps that have all the high end and mid range bark I could ever want. So I wanted to dial that back a little bit. And you were, and then I was just, I kind of. I think you sent me a bunch of different stuff just to. Well, yeah, and we. Uh, I was was earlier this year. I was yeah. in Seattle, yeah. and I showed you. Well, by the time this comes out, it won't be no big deal. But like the Tortex flow. Yes. I thought for sure maybe you would g- gravitate towards that, but and then you ended up going right back to the T three. Yeah. The T three is just the ultimate because for a long time I played. Um, before I knew you, I played the Jazz XL. Jazz 3 XL, which I didn't know was even a thing. Mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. saw someone have something at a show, and I was like, what in the hell is that? That's like a bigger Jazz 3. Yeah. That's exactly what I want. I can hold on to that one. I can hold on to that, <laughs> but it's still a little thick, mm-hmm. but I'll work with it. And I liked the nylon. I liked the the, the feel off that, but um, the Tortex, man. The Tortex T3 is just like, that's it. Sick. That's That's really it. And are you, uh, you're back on 88? Or are you on, are, what, what's your gauge? The green. Are you, so, yeah, so 88s. 88s. Okay. okay. And you guys make me some some beautiful white ones. Yeah, the new ones are like the ghost theme yeah. fluff ones, right? <laughs> Which people stop and ask me for constantly. I mean, why not? Those right. are awesome. Do you have any of the, the ghost picks? The ghost fluff picks? So I have to always like have a pocket full of them. Like, yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. That's, that's, well, that's what it's all about. Those, are the, right the, those literally do everything. So that's now, actually, that's what I keep in the home studio. I have, you know, I still have several bags. And I've even bought in a couple, like, just regular green ones to have. Sure. So if I'm if someone else is over recording, I give them the green ones. I don't let them play the, <laughs> the yeah. custom. Ones. Yeah, let them have their own mojo though. You know, right. like you know, standard fair. Here's for, your blank slate. Yeah, here's your blank slate. And I, I, I play bass with them. I, I do guitar with them. I do everything with the T threes. Sick. Green T threes. Just that's that's what I've settled on. What an interesting. Uh, I just as you're as you're telling me like about like handing the picks out like. I just think uh, what an interesting, like, energetic exchange it has been yeah. since. I wonder who was the first guy from the stage to be like so cocky. It was like <laughs> you know, like I'm so I'm I'm tearing it up so badass right, right now, and these people right here, just watch this. I'm gonna throw my pick at them. Right. You know, like who did that first? I want to know if if anybody out there listening to this has the historical record. I would or, love to know. Like let. Tell me and Fluff. Because know. <laughs> I'm a, you know, David Gilmore, the Pink Floyd book. David Gilmore, like they have, the, his text still has his original little travel ca- gig case with what? a couple of spare tubes mm-hmm. and his Herco or whatever they're called. The Herco. The yeah. Herco picks. Yeah. But David Gilmore used to carry a little tin with 10, ten picks for the tour. Like <laughs> they didn't give those things out back then. Right. It wasn't, it's such a different climate now. Yeah. The support was never there. Is as far as that small consumable stuff, anyway. Yeah, and I, know? I, I, and like, my thought around it is like, I wonder if it was, was it like an angsty punk band that was like, we don't care about things and we just throw stuff because we're spitting yeah. on the crowd, or was it like the rock star guitar god that was like, I'm so awesome. It had to be in the eighties. Like you know, like yeah, I. I it, could, it wasn't the clash what, did, in the 70s. Did Ingve Malmsteen like like I mean if if there was somebody that could have like you I know don't what? know we should I'm gonna deep dive this later it'll be interesting right I like, wanna I wanna know like how how did that start the history of pick tossing yeah because because then because now it's like you get you you're you know it's still the thing like if you're in the, in the in the front yes. area and you're a, a fan of the guitar ish I mean or the band even even if you're not a player like if a, if a guitar uh, uh, pick or drumstick comes your way like the crowd like, so goes crazy when right? we so. um every night every night when we get off there is a row of kids in front and I my, my hand to god please can i get a pick please can i get a pick please can i get a pick <laughs> and if i've played it that's even a bonus like they totally. freak out but these people like these some of these like some of the girlfriends are like please can i get a pick yeah and like that's such a thing now yeah when did that happen yeah i, I mean i remember as a kid i mean like probably the first time that i freaked out about something like that was I saw Meshuga on one of their very first tours. Maybe their actually second tour, but first real tour in the states was with Chaosphere, and wow. o- opening for 
uh, sick of it all and Slayer at the Warfield in SF. I drove oh down my with God. my buddy Ryan, and nobody else knew who Mashuga was, right? Mm. Like we they had were a, a secret for a long time. Super secret. Yeah. And for us, they they were two or three years old, and that was like in '96 because we had a Swedish exchange student in our yeah. tiny little podunk town. This guy named Klaus, and he and he, we were, we were, me and my buddy Ryan distinctly remember we we're just such Pantera heads, right? Sure. And we were just always smoking out, listening to Pantera, my little VW, driving around in between classes, skipping classes or whatever, and just preaching the, preaching the church and the yeah. like the whole thing of Pantera. Like we were all about it, and 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 Klaus like finally spoke up one day. He's like, you know, you guys, I know you love this band, but there are other things. And You're like, no, there's not. And and they're and they're actually there's this band that's kind of like maybe better. And I'm like. I'm like, this is sacrilege, you know? We'd like totally... Get out. Get yeah. out, yeah. He's like, no, no, here, here's this... I have this cassette, it's... Uh, and I, I look at it, and I saw the cover, and it was Destroy, Race, and Prove, and I was like... Oh, my God. And we were, we were, I, was like, I was like, okay, buddy, you think this is better than Pantera? All right, I'll put it in the, my, my classic tape deck in my 79 VW Rabbit with the, with the crank yeah. moonroof, and we're all smoking out of a can in my car, you know? <laughs> like, like, be, like, just kids, silly kids. <laughs> I'll, 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 we'll give it a shot. So we pull out the Pantera Live 101 Proof yeah, or whatever it was in there and put that in. And it, we're like, it's like... And... and I wanted to like it, but I was like, I couldn't understand it to be honest the first time. I don't. I, I think you know what. I think that that goes for a lot of. Yeah, and the fact that he was, you know, like better than Pantera guy, I was like, nope. I, I didn't even let the first song finish. I was like, yeah, that's not. Doesn't even have any groove. I can't. I'll be back another time, buddy. Nice try. You know. And the, but he left the tape in my car, and it was like, uh, you know, like a month later, I was bored, and I and I put it in, and I was like, oh wait, this is genius and then and it was like uh senior year or whatever we uh we bought tickets because Meshuggah was in in from sweden we had read these articles in guitar player magazine about how they somehow subsisted off of government assistance like like yeah. basically like a sweetest form of welfare yeah. and i was like we're just like man they're like the greatest band next to pantera like and they they they're on welfare how is like like we just couldn't yeah. wrap our minds yeah. around it because they must be famous they must be Making money, but they not, but but not really. You know, no. you're not at that point in time. And uh, anyway, we bought tickets and went down. And I remember there was like six of us. <laughs> like when Meshuggah played, they played about five songs to open that show. And there My was probably there was like six of us that cared. There were, everybody was up getting drinks yeah. and like doing a thing, and here, here we're just like, oh my god! Like the 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 earth is opening up wide, and we're seeing this like thing yeah. that like yeah. is. And 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 Tomas threw a a, a a stick at the end, and I I just remember diving for. It. I was like, oh my god, greatest drummer next to Vinnie Paul, like just threw a stick. Oh my god! And like I dove, and I was like, wrestling was. I was like, get away! And I, <laughs> and I look at this dude, and I'm like, oh wait, it's you, Ryan. It's like my buddy, my buddy, my buddy, You're wrestling my for buddy it. Ryan. I'm like, all right, I got. We'll we'll take this home together. I don't know how we're gonna deal with we'll this. Saw it half later. <laughs> like, yeah. we'll, we'll deal with it later. It was like. But I remember the the feeling of of that like you know somebody threw something from the stage, so like it it means something extra and they yeah. used it. Yes. So I don't know. We're gonna have to kind of like yeah. keep our ears open and deep dive around maybe how that started or if, if there's if it's even possible to trace. Eighties. You'd think so, but I mean, like there could have been something in the seventies, like. The seventies, I feel like it was such a like an arena rock time that there wasn't really the mindset or space to do that. Yeah, maybe not the closeness and like there proximity. wasn't the closeness there though. Yeah. But I mean, eighties was a, I mean, eighties was arena rock like for the. But there big was air. a lot of there, but there was a lot of sh- stuff happening in in the smaller clubs as that's well. That's true. That's true. That's true. I mean, a lot the yeah. Sunset Strip stuff, right? And like that has to be like, hey, baby, here's a pick. Like, yeah, that had to be. It had to be from a dude to a chick. It had to be. This is this is how uh, you're gonna get backstage tonight. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. show show the show exactly the, show right. That's exactly what I was going at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> take this. Yeah, I mean, you, I see, I saw that stuff happening. Like, you yeah. see, I see it happening. All I mean, people. Oh, it uh, still happens. Yeah, it's all. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, so that's that's all uh, interesting. I want I want to move to the second like kind of uh, pivotal question that okay. I like to ask, and that's. Um, you know, perspective on life. Do you have something you could share with us that uh, maybe keeps you motivated or inspired? And like, uh, 
Do you yeah. Have, do you have a, like a, a thing? Yeah. Here's what I tell. Here's what I tell my daughter. So like my daughter, like being a dad has always brought an interesting perspective to my life. But, and I wish someone had told me this when I was her age, but like all of us have to kind of figure it out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But once you get older and once you go and see the world, you realize that everybody at every level is just trying to figure it out themselves too. Mm. Everybody is. Mm -hmm. The president, the (laughs) (laughs) president, you know, huge CEOs, Tim Cook from Apple. Yeah. Everyone at some level is going, well, fuck it. I don't know. Let's try that. Right. No one has it figured out. And I think, Growing up in the Northwest and like the kind of family that I grew up in, you always had this kind of unspoken sense of you were expected to have it figured out. And that gave you a huge sense of anxiety and stress Mm. in a general, real broad general sense. And I'm not talking like, you know, you're not standing up at night going, oh my God, I don't have it figured out. But post high school, you know, do you have a plan? That's that typical American thing. What are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to be when you grow up? And you know what? No one knows, and if they if they say they do, they're lying. Yeah, they're fucking lying. Well, I, I will say I will say there have been plenty of people that I've met through the years that like had an early intuition, totally, and and followed it, Absolutely. and then and you find like, well, I started playing guitar, or I started playing piano, I started you know learning how to paint when I was X years. Absolutely, and, and still but here. it's never a straight line. But yeah, it's not a straight line, and it's not it's not a sure thing. That right, like well. that—that's the part of it too, especially in the arts, as you know. I mean, right, like you can you can almost have somewhat kind of a sure thing if you become a real estate agent and, and but and you and you you do the math yeah. or be a doctor and you do the math, but then the, the variable is still you. Like, are are you the right personality for yeah. the thing? You know, and but yeah. like, you know, there's there's like more surefire potentialities, but and okay, so. You know, no one, no one has it figured out. Everyone, to, on some level, is just going, "Well, fuck it, let's try that. Let's see, let's fly with it. Let's, mm-hmm. we'll do, we're going to do the best we can with the information that we have, right? Yeah, on a life level. But the second thing is, you know, you never know what someone's shit is. You never know what, what their history is, what they, what's happened to them that day, that morning, mm-hmm. what they're, where they came from. Mm-hmm. Cut, cut everyone some slack. Like mm-hmm. that's what I try to instill in my daughter. Like you know, you don't, don't judge anybody. Like you don't know what they've been through and how everyone has a story. And so don't ever think that you're the only one who has a story. Everyone has a story. And so the best you can do in life is to just, you have to just be cool. Everyone, man, like, man, that's so true. Just be cool. I could, I could, I could do better at that in, in my, we in all my job, could though. in my, in my day job. I'm just thinking about it right now. Like I had a couple of conversations that I had like around work stuff and I'm like, uh, deadlines or like misunderstandings. Like the right. miscommunications is the worst for me. Cause like, Same. even when I think that I've been super, super clear and then, and it, and with somebody you're working with, it's like, Oh no, like I, 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 you said this, and I'm like, oh man, I'm going to show you the email or blah blah blah. I'm going to retract and, yeah. and and I and I, to show you that I'm right. And like, man, you know, the whole being right thing is a the dick such wagon a trap. contest. Yeah, yes. it's such a trap. Yeah, I agree. I, I I agree that this is knowledge that should have been given to us way earlier. And like, I don't know. And like, <laughs> well, and the, and in that, like, I don't know. I don't know anybody's given upbringing, of course. So maybe right. mine. You know, there was definitely definitely unique aspects to my upbringing that most people don't experience. However, I think so American society in particular really puts a lot of pressure on the young people to just well, you better have a, you better have a plan when you leave because you're out by eighteen. There, there's that thing that's that old I don't know Generation X thing. I don't know where that came from, but uh, you know. But again, the cost of stuff is as such where like. You can no longer, like when my parents would give me shit about, you know, well, I don't know. They wouldn't give me shit about it because I moved out when I was 17. But, you know, when they try to give give shit in general senses, like with my brother or something like that, like, oh, you, when I was your age, you moved out. But I'm like, yeah, a car was like three grand when you graduated high school. Like, get the fuck out of here. Right. You know what I mean? I mean like, th- yeah, there is inflation, but that's cheap. It's different. It's different. Like, yeah. you could get a job at a grocery store and get an apartment and i mean when i started driving i started driving in 1996 20 dollars would fill up your tank get you a pack of smokes and get you a a burger off the 99 cent menu oh yeah easy dude i remember yeah i started driving in like 90 well like 92 or 93 i remember well i actually started driving sooner i i my dad taught me to, to drive when I was like 
twelve and a half, and we we had like a, like a, a, a 1966 Chevelle Malibu, and wow, uh, like it was Shovel super. Head. Yeah, uh, it was, flathead. Uh, well, it's the it's the sh- the two door hardtop Chevelle Malibu 66, 327, uh, kind of flat. Yeah, kind of flat with the wraparound yep. grill, and then oh. and then and when I was fourteen, he was like, "We're gonna get you one, kid." So like, I had the savings from my grandmother, and and uh, we bought a '67 for me, so it had the points on the so, top. So, so it's, that's the shovel. Yeah, the little shovel around the yeah. side. And, oh, uh, and and good. so I learned to work on those things and drive way too early. And then, like, before I ever got turned 16, like, my brother and I would steal the car. Like, <laughs> like wait till everybody's sleeping and, like, push the car down the road and then drive from Corning to Chico and go hot rod around and do stupid things as kids, you yep. know? But, uh, but, like, that whole uh, thing, I remember being, that must have been, like, 91, 92, and just, like... Remembering that, like, we could save five bucks, right? You know, and then and like put like gas was like a dollar twenty a gallon or something like that. Like, yep. and I remember people at that time going back in my day. I remember when gas was yeah. like twenty five cents a gallon, or I'm like, we were like, whoa, you're old. Yeah, look at us, fluff. We're like, it's five bucks a yeah. gallon almost yeah. like now in most places. I remember my grandfather telling me when he was sixteen years old, he used to go to the vending machine for cigarettes. And cigarettes were nine cents. Oh my and God. you would put a dime in, and in the wrapping of the cigarette pack, there would be a penny on one side and a pack of matches on the other for your penny for your change. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and he said when they hit when they hit 25 cents, he was like, nope, I'm, I quit. Fuck that. Good for, good for him. That was like the 40s or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing that that would be, jeez, uh, the, the, the penny part is the part that right? I, I'm loving about that. You know? I, I was like, that's amazing. Because 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 then there's, whose job was it to put pennies? Yeah, someone with a so, roll. Of somebody pennies. somebody had to do that. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah, that absolutely. Was, that was their job. And and it was what was their pay? <laughs> right <laughs> at that day and time. Right. That was not a probably lucrative job, but yeah. you know somebody. But, had to yeah. Do so like you know just never never jump to conclusions. Like we love to jump to conclusions nowadays. We want oh, everything man. fast. We yeah. want everything now, social media, we want that instant satisfaction, and we want that social currency. However, with the social currency comes a lot of judgment, and it just, mm. I wish, I wish just people could have a little bit of perspective in their fellow man. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting, because, uh, especially talking to, to Jared, too, and, like, and, 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 and considering, like, putting myself in your shoes to some extent, and, the, and then also, you know, all, all, both of us, yeah. And, and Jared included, like knowing the other side of it, knowing where we, where, knowing where you come from, yeah. and knowing that it hasn't always been this way, and yeah. uh, to 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 have this type of accolade and this type of success, um, it, it's looking at looking at like what's going on with the general public that you know uh, that, right. that, that 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 fosters this, and it's like well, there's a there's a there's a general sense of lack, and like you can see that like. You know, a lot of people that haven't been paid attention to, and you see all you see all this trauma, you see this suffering yeah. in people. Yeah, trauma is a good word. Yeah, trauma is, I think, a really good one, and I'm been it's one that I've uh, through relationship recently I have been bumping up against yeah. over and over again. I, I, initially with with uh, with a partner, but like then also how uh, when when her trauma gets you know uh, yeah. it's like triggered that it then triggers mine too, like. And, we go back and forth. I was like, whoa, okay. Uh, uh, yes, me too. Oh, like, man. so like mine was like, you know, I was divorced. I got divorced after, you know, I've told the story another, you know, a couple of times, but, um, you know, I was with my ex for so long that my style of relationship is a very defensive one. Mm. And I had never really thought about this stuff until mm. I got into an actual healthy relationship where there are no mind games. There are no, mm. this is a total tangent. I apologize. No, but, but um, I never gave any thought to we have relationship style. So if you're really in a, I was in a relationship with someone for ten years, which I now know as emotionally abusive mm. uh, for me. Mm-hmm. So like whenever I would hear the door slam, I would instantly get into you know emotional armor is on, and holy shit, I'm ready for fucking battle because I know that that's her telling me that it's time to fucking fight. Right. My lady, now that we've been together for several years now, I am still. If a door slams, I'm ready to fucking fight. I'm ready to get in an argument. And she's just closing the damn door, dude. Like, mm. like the style. And when she does something wrong, she goes, I'm really sorry about that. I apologize. And I'm like, I'm, I don't even know how to handle that. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, what? 
you're that, being an adult about this. Like, this is unbelievable. So I'm having to readjust myself. Yeah. In accordance, because my ca- my compass was so fucked up. I find, I'm in a similar place. It's like, weird. I'm in a similar. I to was, self-evaluate so much. I mean, my 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 marriage was ten years. I mean, it was the marriage was like for three, but the relationship was for like ten. And it was actually a really good thing. Yeah. Like she's amazing, and I I will love her forever. And I'm so glad she's remarried now to somebody. Good for that, you to even say that. Like but. I, well, it's 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 a joy because we 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 were really good friends before. Uh, thing got anything got romantic, and then, but like we were we're like almost the same exact age. We're mm-hmm. we, we acted almost like brother and sister yeah. more often. Like uh, it was a lot of it, we did a lot of growing up together from like 23 to yeah. 33. Like it's, same it's, with it's, mine. It's, it's a yeah. chasm of like growth, self personal growth, and when you Absolutely. do that with somebody else, it's it's uh it's it's it obviously transforming uh but there are certain little things that uh you know in in our relating style that like uh just like you there's these cues that would come in and i'm like oh wait that means this it's real small stuff and, and that you, means that and if you're not careful you are just gonna go down that road man yeah. and it sucks so i have and i and i, okay. I i'm finding out yeah i'm finding out on the other side oh wait just because you, when you when you make a face like that doesn't mean that that, that, that it's war. No. Well, that's interesting because I'm used to like that that somebody breathing heavily and that's war or Dude, you know all yes. these little these little yes. cues and I'm like and and so I didn't recognize that I was going into this fight or flight thing and being super defensive preemptively without actually having evidence of there being right. anything you know to fight against and no one likes to, to look in the mirror and like uh, really like you know no that's never fun for anybody like no. we're human beings we don't like to like call our shit out on ourselves but you know if you want something to work you, you have to do that yeah well and i i think uh, i'm I i'm I'm, I'm learning you know i constantly about the trying to actually listen to understand before listening to respond just in, waiting. There's a huge in, difference between waiting to respond and actually listening yeah. and changing accordingly in real and, time. Uh, well, and, and part of what I was going to go back to say was that, with especially with like the fans and like and relationships in general, like um, it was brought to my attention through uh, uh, through my friend, this friend, uh, well, through who I've been seeing, and um, she 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 brought like the, there was uh, this. It's not like a podcast. It's like it's a it's a column that she. It's really well written, like mm-hmm. love and sex column. Yeah. That she forwards her favorite ones to me, you know, mm-hmm. and I, and um, and I really, I really like it. But this there was one that recently that was about trying to transform the way we see people from like f- from from their deeds and like uh and how we um what they can do for us and all these things but instead seeing them and how they suffer like in in in, in, in not not oh, in a, not, wow. in, not in a negative way not in saying like oh like i'm trying yeah, to yeah. pick you up pick out like the ways that you're tra- traumatized just seeing the other side but but trying to be compassionate and trying to go oh wow you know like if that if this is a if we're, we're having a triggered moment that's interesting like so, so yeah. there's definitely so there's got to be suffering underneath this like what how how mm-hmm. can I, how can I uh, help ease back like and not further yeah. trigger it and better understand you so that we can maybe heal it instead of like just keep breaking off the scab and so, opening the wound and exactly you know? so kiss yeah so that's been like a huge thing in, in like with me and my lady like she will go stop let's talk about this how do you feel right now mm. no one's ever done that to me in my entire life no one's ever actually stopped asking me like how do you feel. Like, I'm, whoa, like, even just that, I'm like, I'm sorry, like, that, you're blowing my mind right now. She's like, no, let's talk about you. Like, what are you, so, it, it takes that kind of person, like, I could never have that amount of, you know, ability to stop and just go, okay, what am I doing, okay, what am I feeling, you know, it takes her to do that. Mm. So that's, that's how, I know it's like, okay, no, this is, this is tangible, this is a real amazing thing. Yeah, that's, that's what a, what a, um, that's what relationships are for, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, totally. can't, we, it's hard to, and to do any of that type of work without a mirror in that way, yeah. to, to mirror back yeah. to you. Yeah. Uh, well, that's good, that's a good, t- this is a good, t- good tangent here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. you know, but you know, I, I want to, I wanted to ask you about, like, you, you, you had this recent trip. Like to Japan, yeah, and yeah, and it was like you, you kind of started to mention to me on the phone the other day about like this <laughs> this kind of revelation, yeah. And I said like, oh wait, don't <laughs> just wait. Like, I want tell me about okay. that. What what happened? So I go over to Japan. I'm hired 
to go over there. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm invited over there to just go and hang out. Uh-huh. Um, from eBay Japan and Ishibashi Music, which is a huge music, music store in Japan, the biggest in Japan. They basically contacted me and they were like, hey, you want to come over and hang out? Like, we'll, we'll fly over here if you want to come and like, just see the store. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I want to go to Japan. Yeah, yeah, let's go to Japan. Yeah. And they're like, okay, cool. Well, here's your flight. And that was that. Like, they were so cool. Wow. And um, so I go over there and I, you know, we live in an extreme political climate in a climate bubble in America with the Trump admin and stuff like that. And, like, all the controversy surrounding that. And it's easy to get in that mode. But, you know, you go over to a place like Japan. And I don't know what to expect. And the people are very nice because obviously, like, I stick out like a sore thumb over in Japan, <laughs> right? Like, people were looking at me like, who is this dude? Yeah. I have my, my bare tooth shirt on and, like, you know, I'm wearing a backpack and I'm around, I'm, just, I'm talking to a camera walking down the street. Like, it's kind of weird, right? Right. So, there's, and everyone's really nice and I find it refreshing and I'm kind of alarmed by it because I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, what is this about? Like, mm. I don't know. I don't, I've never experienced anything like this. This is a new thing for me. I'm in the store. I'm in a store. I'm in like one of the, I'm in the brass and woodwind store of Ishibashi and they don't know who I am yet because I'm just setting up and I'm waiting for the people that are uh, with me to come mm -hmm. or they're in the back room or something. They're not with me. And I go, I have my hand full. So I go to, to adjust my tripod to drop the camera down, but it catches the webbing of my hand in between my thumb and my pointer finger and it comes down on the webbing of my hand and I start bleeding like it, it, I really hurt myself mm -hmm. and I don't even get a chance to say something and the lady from behind the counter comes out with some bandages and then a customer gets like this saline solution out of her purse <laughs> with some bandages and they start washing my hand off without saying a thing to me. Uh, hold hold your hand, hold hand, like and they just tell me to keep my hand steady, and they clean off my wound and bandage it for me, and they haven't even acknowledged me as a person yet. They're just worried about my well being as people. Mm. It just blew me away. Like it was a moment I was just like, whoa, okay, because they they don't know I'm over there. Like you know, they don't know what I'm doing. They don't yeah. know me. Right? They just saw uh, a need and re yeah. responded. And just re they just simply reacted. Like, it was it was incredible. So, I'm thinking about that. I'm bandaged up. We go down, and there's this, you know, this famous sidewalk, or this famous crossing in Tokyo in downtown. Okay. Um, you know, it's a big, thick, you know, there's just tons of people crossing the street. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it must be, oh, God, a thousand people crossing the street at once. Oof. And not a single person is bumping into another. Like, and there's people riding bikes through the damn crowd, but people are moving out of the way and they are also in turn being very careful not to hit anybody. And there's this like mutual respect for your fellow countrymen that I thought was astounding. Like mm. it's so individualistic in America. And then you go over to somewhere like Japan and they're, they're asking you how you are, you know, while they're on fire. Like, are you okay? Do you need anything? I'm like, well, you're, you're on fire. Like you should, you should get some water. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 don't worry about me. What about you? Yeah. It's what's, what can I do for you? Like, how can I help you? And I'm not saying everyone is like in a great mood or anything like that, but sure. there is still this common respect that everybody has for each other over there because they have to, because it's so crowded. I mean, it's the size mm -hmm. of California with the population of the world a hundred years ago. Like that's crazy. Wow. So you have to have respect for everybody's space and time. Mm -hmm. So no one wants to waste anybody's time and no one wants to, wants to cause any inconvenience to anybody else. And that's just a universal thing that's baked into their culture. It's interesting to me that, uh, that it's almost, it almost plays into like what you, uh, we're talking about earlier, like, like, yeah. you, don't, you don't, you don't know what, no, uh, what, what somebody's going through that day or where their trauma li lies or anything. And it, it, that's an interesting story because they didn't know. Nope. They didn't know nope. like what your situation, what your story nope. was. They're just like, I, I'm getting right to it. And, and so it's, uh, it's almost like, uh, you, you, you went to Japan and you, you saw it manifest like this kind of thing that you kind of like hold dear to yourself anyway, a principle that you're like, but, but it was manifested in a way that like you hadn't seen before yeah. in, in, in like in a general population. Cause you're no, right. No, nothing like that. Like they were treating me how my friends treat me after we have some history together. Right. 
Because here, like, I, I mean, you, you see it all the time. There's all these different types of YouTube videos where people, where homeless people are, are freezing. They're, like, yeah. they, they, they do a thing where, like, oh, this guy is cold. And let's see how many people walk by him. And not one person, that, right. you know. Yeah, do you think I saw any homeless people in Tokyo? Nope, not a one. Really? Not a I was one. Gonna, that was going to be my next question, actually. Nope, not a single person. Not a, not a single homeless person. Mm. Not even a thing. Wow. Well, we have we just definitely have a lot to learn here. I just yeah, like I asked. Um, so the the lady I was with, um, that was, well, I'll just say the lady's with. I'm not supposed to say where she's from, but um, we'd ask her just while we were eating dinner. I was like, you know, yeah, because she asked how I got into this, like how the whole YouTube thing really kind of took off. I told uh -huh. her, well, as a result of a divorce, and I just kind of went for it because I had nothing else to lose, and and I was like, you know, you ever been in a long relationship and you're just kind of down in the dumps? And she goes, nope. Nope, because that would get in the way of my career, which is what I want. So, no, I've never been in a long-term relationship. I was oh. like, to consciously just go, here's what I'm doing. This kind of also goes back to, like, you know, everyone has it figured out. And, you know, sure. that was in reference to America, not anywhere else. Because, like, you know, she was like, nope, I knew what I wanted to do, and I do what I have always wanted to do. And, and that was that. Like, nothing's going to get in the way of that. That's so. That, that's also an interesting. That's crazy. Statement. Well, because I've I've been called on that a little bit in, yeah. in my life, you know, because I'm I've I find refuge in work and I find. Uh, and we it, can it, talk about that too. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah, cause I have some input there. Okay, because I mean, that's an interesting part, right? Like, I mean, like I I, I want to believe that I value relationship above that, but you want to believe that? I want to. You should. Yeah. But but I and, and I and I and I've met a few people recently that really do seem to value the relation you know the potential relationship values are higher yeah. than you know than career and uh, and it, it's not I want to believe that that I agree with that but I also like my actions don't necessarily yeah add up to that because and I, and I had to unpack it the other day uh, in a conversation and I was like wow it's interesting that I think that it's because of upbringing and trauma of like not feeling uh not a trauma and a and a i mean my my mom's awesome and like totally, totally good totally. you know my my dad's situation is another story but um not feeling like fully seen heard or understood and then like you know sure. i'll show you guys that i'm absolutely gonna be. so like there's this under the, under the hood you know work ethic that's you're like, raging against your own machine yeah and then uh, and all these years later i'm like well what is still like I'm, what am i trying to prove you know what? Totally. What, am I am I am I working because I love to do it, or am I doing? Am I still like trying still to running. show my dad, or show you know like right. you know show Uncle Tom that you know I'm not I you know I'm not a dummy and I don't have to work. I concrete. just had this conversation with my lady right before I left for this tour. Really? Um, so uh, background with my uh, old marriage and all this stuff. Like um, I was she she had set my ex had sat me down. She was like, you know, this is kind of a waste of time. Like, don't you think you should maybe like pull back a little bit? And I was just like, I love this. Like, I love what I'm doing, and I don't care if anyone. It's not about views, and it's not about numbers. It's just about I have an outlet now, mm -hmm. and this is really really cool. Like, I love home recording. I love writing music, and I love gear. And I've kind of found a way to put all those things together. Mm. I'm gonna pursue it, whether you're, you want want me to or not. And I have always, like, there's always a part of me that, like, I burn down my family life mm. for my craft. For me. But even after all that was gone, my only, my only refuge was diving into my work to survive. It was a literal survival after the divorce. You know, I lost my job at Boeing. And it was the whole crux of turning point in my entire life. So all I did was just work. And I am still on that kick. Mm. So now it's come to the point where that mountain or that little molehill is now a giant mountain that I'm still trying to handle by myself, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, video editing, production, music writing, and I'm trying to always up my game sure. quality-wise. And now it's it's such a big bite for me to take that my lady had to sit me down. She was like, you know, you need to slow down. Like, you need to just, just stop. Like, we've been together for several years and you have never just got to... You've never relaxed. You won't allow yourself to mm. spend a single spare moment not working, and I'm worried. And I'm like, she's just like, what are you? What are you fighting? So, it, like, are you afraid of something? And I'm like, yeah, I'm afraid it's all gonna go away. Like, right. I'm afraid the second I say no or hold on, it's never gonna come back, and I don't ever want to be in that place again. She's like, yep, yeah, that's all done. 
that's going back, kind of going back to the trauma thing. But yeah. I've never had anyone tell me, you know, maybe you should just take take a break. You know what? Don't do anything today. Man. Just don't don't go and work. Just pick a movie to watch. Just go pick a movie. I'm like, no, but that's not being productive. And she's like, so what? Yeah, but you're you working. That. <laughs> I work from six thirty a.m. to nine o'clock at night, seven days a week doing what I do. No, I, I believe it. There, we've, we've exchanged texts and I've seen you, I've seen you active early in the morning when I'm up like, dude, time, like between five and, and you're just as bad seven. as I am, dude. Yeah. Like, well, and you, you, I, I feel very parallel to you in that way. Cause at the end of my marriage, that was, the, there was a point of contention. Like my career was starting to take off in artist right. relations and it was, a, it was like, well, you seem to love this more than blah, blah, blah. Hey, it's like, it, I've Damn. always wanted this and I've, yeah. I, I've I've always wanted something in the business. And when the band didn't work out, like, yeah. I, you know, I didn't realize that I wasn't going to be a rock star. I was like, oh, wait, I have these other skills. And it starts to synthesize here. I mean, like... You're going to chase that, man. Yeah, and it's and, and here I am, I, and it's been upping, I've been upping the levels and the whole mm-hmm. deal. And I, and I still, I, I, you know, there's an element of feeling a bit of a slave to the grind, you know. Uh, there absolutely Which is. is a great Skid Row record, I have to admit. <laughs> it, I was just about I mean, to say it that. It really is. Like, absolutely. Like, underrated. Yeah, like I agreed. And in, even the record after that. Subhuman race. It was actually really good. It was, it was actually really good. It was heavy. It was kind of the grunge yeah, Skid Row yeah, record, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Like, yeah. Oh man. But the, so in the line. So what's unique about my situation is like, I cannot do anything for a week straight if I wanted to. No one is telling me right to get in there and make the videos and to write the songs for the videos and stuff like that. But like, that's how I got to this place is by never ever allowing myself a single moment to breathe. Just but, constant hustle constant dude vacations my lady fucking it drives her nuts because she's like you didn't bring a laptop did you i'm like maybe and like i'm still right like i'm working man like i am a workaholic and i got it from my dad but he did it to feed his kids sure i'm doing it because i just don't know how to do anything else but just like why why am i killing myself to do this i don't know right right she's like you know you won you (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, I have I have to say that for myself, I mean, you might find some of this to ring true too. But there's an element of it that it there's there. I don't want I want to I don't like saying this, but there's a, there's an, uh, an element of avoidance, you know, avoid yeah. avoidance of uh, of deeper relating, avoidance of of having this, th- this space yeah. to actually deeper relate. Mm-hmm. You know, even with somebody that you are, you for sure love, you live with, or like you know you're yeah. committed to da, no. da, da, the whole thing. Absolutely. Uh, because uh, there's not been a lot of examples in my life of, of what it really actually looks like to have a healthy, deeper relating wow. thing. No, no, you just blew my mind. Yeah. I mean, so. I, yeah. So my lady said, you know what I want for Christmas? I want to just, I want to have you not filter through your phone. Oh. Uh, I want you. How's that feel? Uh, <laughs> to, to like. It cut me super, super fucking deep. But, but she's not wrong. Like, and I can say that with all honesty. Like, yeah, she's totally right. She has me. Like, yeah, yeah. She's just like, I, I want just, just spend time with me. Oh man. Like <laughs> legit, spend time with me. Not next to me on working, dude. Or networking or answering emails from your boss or you know, yeah, plug in like, stuff. This sits so, so close to my home too. Like dude. hearing you, hearing her say that about you. And- but, but I'm not gonna let. This time, it's going to go different. Yeah. Because last time I went, well, I'm going to fucking show you. It's not, it's not, that's not the case this time. Because there was underlying things last time. Mm -hmm. There was always underlying issues that I can look back and go, oh, man. Like, why didn't I just say that or say this or whatever? This time, it's like, no, I have to know and I have to trust that, you know, she's right. Like, I should. Because, like, now I'm starting to, like, forget. Dude, I, I have a sharp memory I'm losing my wallet places now. Like there's, mm. I'm, it's, there's other symptomatic things that are just like, oh, okay, I should probably slow down a little bit. Right. It's like after this tour, and we're gonna get home like probably Christmas Eve. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna do anything for like a week. I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm not doing anything. I'm, I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna actually take a legit break. Well, it's it's interesting because I mean I, I, you know I teach yoga and it's like part of my my passion and like part I'm I'm constantly. 
I, and I do, I do take time for myself. I do like, I do these things, but I, I'm kind of like selfish with it and I keep it to myself a lot yeah. of time. I'm like, I'm going to take all this time for myself with the dog at the ocean and do these yeah. things. But when it comes to relationship in the mirroring aspect, the conditioning and the trauma, it, it, it it's, it's, there's, it's, it's an almost, you know, at, at, in the beginning, it's an uncontrollable variable that like you don't, you're not yeah. even recognizing yeah. that it is at play. And then slowly but surely, if you stick it out, you start oh, realizing, oh man, um, we're in this place, you know, right. it's, we got to like undo it a little bit, and take a step back and put the space in the life, let life get lived in real time so that when you do come back to the craft yep. that, you know, A, you're fresher, B, you know, uh, you, there's, you, there's huge benefits. Yeah, yeah. There's all these different things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, let's, uh. Thank you so much yeah, man. for, for being here and doing this with me. Uh, I'll, I'll, I, we got to wrap it up, but I want to ask you, sure. uh, if there's any, um, underground underdog, uh, musicians or bands that you might like to shout out and say that we, we should check out right now. Actually. Uh, okay. So I did a record, uh, about a year ago for the, uh, for friends of mine called Phantom Racer. Okay. And they're like a nineties fat wreck, uh, propagandi lag wagon shreddy huge melodic songs shredding drummer dude the drummer did the record in one take it was un- unbelievable un fucking believable nick is such a beast that. um and we did old school and they came over to my house we banged out a punk rock record it was amazing uh, phantom racer is just so legit phantom. and also um head honcho and there's some actual members uh, of those same bands that are in both bands okay they're both seattle then yeah they're both okay. seattle punk rock cool but uh yeah. Phantom Racer and Head Honcho. Phantom Racer and Head Honcho. Okay. They're, they're killing it right now. And what's your favorite thing you're listening to right now? Dude, I'm a huge ghost nut. Right. So I'm still on... Still on that new record. I'm still on the new record. However, um, I'm a huge Beartooth nut. And I've also been listening to a lot of uh, like Dead Mouse, And I'm nice. kind of all over the place lately. I love Dead Mouse. Um, but like real chill, like glitchy, real mellow, electronic, like... Just stuff you can just kind of study to and just yeah. kind of just, you don't have to pay attention to vocalist, instrumental stuff. Yeah. Let's, let's the nervous system settle a little bit. Yeah. 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 I, just, I, you just I, pull back. I don't listen to a lot of metal. Yeah. I don't either. But I, but I still enjoy it. Oh, absolutely. But, but here's the, here's, I don't seek new stuff though. Yeah. I don't really either. But I have a couple of friends that are just like, oh, have you tried all these new things? And I'm like, I, I, I put them on if they grab me. I'll, sure. put, I'll put them in rotation absolutely. a little bit. But, I'm I, I'm 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 admittedly like more into trap and hip hop and uh, electronic uh, type things and like poppy yep. type things. Post Malone, is yeah. a friend of ours actually. That's yeah, a... I, I I I like a couple of his songs. Yeah. I, they've made it, I've made one of his tracks, made it into a yoga playlist. For, for dude, Beer Bongs Bentleys is like such an amazing record. Yeah, dude, it's really really. Is good. That, that's it, we're in an interesting place for music. It's it's all over the place. Yeah, it's, it is. It's doing good things. Yeah. Well, thank thanks again for sharing. Dude, that's <laughs> Players Pick Podcast, Picks and Perspective with Chris Johnson. Table.